guys um, probably feel embarrassed about having a hair loss product on their you know, side locker. We wanted to change that. So create a brand that would make them feel okay about using those and that it's mm. a normal thing. How are you? Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment Podcast with me, Gary Fox. Today, my guests are Will and Adrian, the co-founders of Sons. They've raised nearly 7 million euro to completely revolutionize men's healthcare. Here's my chat with the lads. Will, Adrian, welcome to the pod. Great to be here. Thanks, We're really, Gary, yeah. really looking forward to it. Yeah, good to be here. One of those duo podcasts. Yeah. You said we'd make life a little harder for you. Yeah, make me work for it. Uh, introduce yourselves. What do you guys do? So uh, I'm Will, uh, one of the founders, and Adrian is the other half of Sons. We're a men's healthcare brand. We provide clinically proven products for male pattern hair loss and for scalp health. Brilliant. So how'd you get started? Our journey, I suppose, comes from myself and Adrian's friendship. Uh, we met in London uh, 12 and a half years ago at this stage, and uh, we became very close friends over there and went through a very common uh, experience of, of, of starting to lose our hair uh, around uh, 18, I think, and both happened to go to a, a clinic in London for that. Um, and I think from my side, coming from a medical background, going to a, a hair clinic, you're probably expecting it to be very medical focused, you know, meeting a doctor. But in fact, it was the opposite, very sales driven, very focused on, you know, how can I sell you a product rather than how can I help you? And even the overall experience of going to a waiting room, you know, at that time I was very embarrassed. I was shy about it. And you're sitting in a waiting room worried if someone that you know will walk in. Um, and then we thought, you know, we had a real opportunity to change that. And like... Go back, go back to how you guys met. We you mates in London, you just bumped into each other. How did you guys get to know each other? It was friends of friends in, in London. Uh, moved over around the same time. Were uh, you working together? No. No social circle. So I think like a lot of people, Irish people who moved to London, we seemed to gravitate towards all the Irish and then mutual friends knew each other. And then we started to play sport together, go to the pub most weekends and, you know, got to know each other from there. What were you doing over there? At the time, I was working with Kerry Group uh, in London, um, so the roles in, in commercial and then business management with them. Um, and, you know, probably, uh, you know, going back, you know, would have always probably had an entrepreneurial interest. Um, and I think, you know, at the time of going to that clinic, probably just really uh, the, the problem or the opportunity was very evident coming out of that. Uh, our timing was very coincidental, right? Um, you know, we, we happened to be in a, a pub in, in South London, uh, got a few points in and shared our experience. And, you know, that's probably the, the different skill sets then. Adrian's background, you know, as a scientist and working in the pharma industry, able to identify that the, the products the clinic was offering were off patent and they were very highly priced. My angle looking at it to go actually did you need to go to the clinic? Was the diagnostic relevant there? Yeah, so you could remove the clinic and, and do that online. And the real unlock is that, right, it's a, 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 a stigmatized area of health, hair loss, you know, and an under-treated uh, area for guys. So a brand would be the unlock for that. Um, you know, and how did you talk about starting something? Because, like, were you just having a pint and decided, oh, let's have a crack at this? Or what was the... Oh, you know, we should do this. Like, yeah, I think there was. We both had thought about it probably separately, um, and I had a conversation about to another friend about the the challenges I had underwent, and I was kind of like the frustrations. Why did I have to go and see a doctor? Why did I have to, you know, go and collect the medicines in a pharmacy? All of that, and then mm. Will had also went through that. So then it was actually, you know, I had thought about it, but I hadn't bent. Okay, let's do that. And it was a Tuesday. I was in work, and Will called me up and said you know, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to, you know, do something? And then that evening we met and we started to like really share the ideas. And at that time we were both in, you know, two two very busy jobs, busy lives. And we just started to really write a business plan and say, you know, where are we going to take it? So it was opportunistic and we kind of never looked back. Had either of you started a business before? I hadn't, but uh, Will, Will had some interesting any, experience. Not, not with any structure, um, <laughs> you know, uh, 
I, I, I had uh, my final year of college, I took a lease in a pub with a number of friends. Um, so we, we ran that for a couple of years. Did not expect you to say that. <laughs> say more about that. That was a lot of fun. Um, Where was it? You know, it was in in Cork. The pub was the Thirsty Scholar at the time, and we we took the lease, and then we re- renamed it the Star, which is the Western Star. Had recently closed down, which would be a kind of very synonymous pub in in a kind of student life in in, in Cork. Um, and uh, yeah, it was we had a a very busy student bar for a couple of years, and it's not our fault that students don't spend money. <laughs> How did you end up even? coming across that like how did you end up leasing a pub um there was a number of us working for for another guy who had a, a couple of pubs at the time i was you know, actually doing the bouncer on the door for it and you know he kind of we were probably uh i'd say we had a good network in the college you know we uh, we played a lot of gaelic football uh, and he kind of came up with the, the opportunity for us to go in on the pub with him and 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 we did that so um I suppose there was a bit of double jobbing with uh, doing the uh, my, my final exams in, in commerce and having the pub as well, but it worked out okay. That sounds like a bad. Again. Sounds like a bad mix, to be fair. <laughs> Student <laughs> and job. owns the pub. Yeah. Um, Too many free drinks, maybe. Yeah, a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? Are you from Cork? Uh, from Dublin originally, but okay. moved to Cork when I was fifteen. Okay. Um, so I spent about eight years and. Um, yeah, I love Cork. Um, you know, a lot of my, my best friends are, are down there now. So I was, unfortunately, I was at the game at the weekend, didn't go. Didn't go our way. That's what we needed. We have a rabid Cork listenership that just, they love anything to do with Corks. So there's our angle, right? There's our hook for this I'm episode. I'm so happily give pl- uh, Cork a massive plug anytime. <laughs> Adrian, where are you from? Uh, Monaghan. So lived there my whole life. Um, played Gaelic football growing up, did a lot of athletics and then moved to Dublin um, to UCD for college and then actually uh, the reason I went to London initially was I did my PhD there and then started my career so was consulting in pharmaceuticals, always been in the healthcare industry and then the last role I had before Sons was with Ernst & Young and the corporate finance team again always healthcare focused, pharmaceutical focused so that's I suppose been some of the knowledge I've had in terms of I wouldn't have had consumer brand experience but actually understanding how you can roll out an operational model and some of the the less cool stuff in the business but important is, is where I where mm. I get stuck in. And how did you feel about starting a business because that sounds like a quite a traditional structured background how did you kind of square that circle in your head yeah like i would be lying if i said it was easy i definitely thought about it a lot you've kind of you've worked pretty hard from your education up to get into a a very structured reliable role knowing where your monthly paycheck will always come from um but as we started to get in for the information and digging and really seeing the opportunity mm. you know at that time didn't have dependents, you know, we weren't married, I didn't have a kid. It was the perfect time to do it. And I think it really, really helped the fact that there was two of us because you felt a safety net knowing the other person was there. You could bounce ideas and you kind of knew you were in it together. So mm. if it didn't work out. I the other one must surely you know what's going clarify, on because I don't. Just to clarify, we're not married. Yeah. <laughs> Separately married. Um, I think one of the things we did early on with the idea was we, we got a, a survey out to about 100 lads and I think that was kind of one of the advantages of being the lived experience and being very close to the customer is we were able to say you know um, this is what we're thinking of doing you know um, is this something that you think about you know hair loss and do you take treatments and that survey came back kind of pretty resounding that you know you had probably you know 70 of the 100 people thinking about it you know maybe 15 to 20 people doing something about it. So immediately there we saw, right, there's, there's something in this. Um, and Is that how you tested the concept for sons? Or, or, or like in terms of like within the first few days, yes. Deadly. And I think that would be like, you know, advice I'd part to any person starting off is like really try and validate mm. the problem or the opportunity that you're going after. Um, and, you know, you can do that you know, for free and very easily with, you know, your your network or, you know, network that you find through I don't know, LinkedIn, wherever it is. Going green, becoming more sustainable, it's everywhere, right? Everyone wants to be greener and do their bit to help. But sometimes for your business, there are more important things to do. It's hard to find the time. Well, take it out of your hands because it's all in a day's work for your local enterprise office. They have the time and the experts to sort it for you. And the best bit is it'll help your business Save you time, money, 
and energy. Perfect, right? The Green for Business audit will assess your business and tell you where you can make changes, and the new Energy Efficiency Grant will help you pay for those changes. And your local enterprise office will sort the whole process for you. Go to www.allinadayswork.ie forward slash green, fill out the form that takes less than two minutes, and your local enterprise office will take from there. Going green? It's all in a day's work for your local enterprise office. Many of you listening to the pod are business owners and savvy investors, but have you been introduced to peer-to-peer lending? Peer-to-peer lending is the practice of lending money directly to other individuals or businesses without the need for a traditional intermediary like a bank. Property Bridges offers you the opportunity to lend directly to experienced home builders across Ireland through their innovative online investment platform. Investors earn returns of up to 9% per annum and your money is fully secured against property. To learn more, visit propertybridges.com. Property Bridges is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to share a game changer for your business, Azure Communications. When it comes to print and marketing solutions, these folks, led by CEO Jenny Johnston, are the real deal. Whether you need an eye-catching brochure, sleek business cards, or a full-blown digital campaign, Azure Communications has you covered. They're not just about high-quality prints or digital campaigns, they're also about delivering great results. And here's the best part. Just for listeners of The Entrepreneur Experiment, you can get 20% off your first order. Just give them a call or go online and use the code FOX20. With personalized service and fast turnaround times, Azure Communications will help you make the impact your business deserves. Trust me, when it comes to making your brand stand out, Azure Communications is the provider of choice. Check them out at azurecom.ie, use code FOX20 and elevate your marketing game today. It's never been easier, and it's a step most people skip because they're afraid to hear no. They're yeah, afraid they're... to hear it's a fucking terrible idea. Don't do it. Mm. Um, how else did you validate? Because this is obviously a podcast called The Entrepreneur Experiment. I believe like business is just a series of experiments run over and over until you find the winning one. How else did you validate the idea? I think from a, a medical and a clinical perspective, we also would find in that survey that people had tried products and they hadn't worked. So from my background, being a PhD scientist and really, you know, wanting to understand the evidence, we identified the two clinically proven products for hair loss and working very closely with our medical director who had a lot of experience, uh, Dr. Knut Mo, working in the hair loss space itself. We validated that we knew these products could work. So we get results in over 90% of men, you know, 80% can see regrowth. So we knew we had a product that would help people with their hair loss and we knew that there was a real interest there. Mm. And we could validate there was like millions of people using the two clinically proven products, but no brand bringing them together and offering them to them. So you had like big, big brand incumbents like like Regain that's been around since 88 or on the prescription side, Propecia from, from Merck, but no one bringing the two of those together and those product work synergistically. So okay, um, that was was a I I think you know we could see that there was you know proof that there was a customer there and a lot of people using them um and I suppose what we were doing is making it more accessible but also then um offering treatment plans that were delivering better efficacy for for the patient. So what was the biggest problem as you saw it? Like what problem? What main thing were you trying to solve? Exactly. untreated population really around it like and what's the a lot of that we felt was around access to the treatments and that could be uh, how convenient it is or how it's priced you know we went back to say like the clinic we went to the treatments priced about 1200 quid a year Oof. For, for us it's about um, 350 to 400 pounds right so um accessibility and then I think the other part was relatability so guys um, probably feel embarrassed about having a hair loss product on their you know side locker we wanted to change that so create a brand that would make them feel okay about using those and that it's Mm. a normal thing so um, I think that was really you know where we saw it and underpinning that was the education so making them aware that our products worked and these are the reasons why being really upfront around it. And if they had had a bad experience before, really letting them know why. So we've always been very education driven, medically focused, but then relatable from a brand perspective. It's probably hard. Like I'm going to pull up on your products here. So if you're watching YouTube, you'll be able to see it. Um, like it's slick packaging. Like it looks well. Like I think that's people often overlook that point of like, like you said, 
it's going to sit in your shelf mm. all the time. You know, yeah. you're like hiding it up the back and yeah. like that's, is, is it, is it still a stigma? I think definitely there's a stigma there. I suppose it's progressing in terms of younger generation are, you know, more open and more willing to talk about it. But I think it's definitely still a taboo subject. People are conscious um, with stat that 70% of men's self-esteem is affected. So mm. what we're trying to do is encourage that conversation to be open and try and, you know, make people realise they can do something about it yeah. if they want to, yeah. but they it's don't have to. It's not all about taking treatments, we'd say, if you educate to go, if you're looking to prevent hair loss, there are treatments that work. Um, you know, this is what they are, uh, or your other choices. You know, don't take them, and you know, great, shave your head and, and move on. You know, for for me, it was um, my body is probably out of proportion to my head, and I think if I shaved, I'd look like a bowling skittle. So, it wasn't wasn't an option for me. We all have our reasons, yeah, right? <laughs> that's a, that's a, there's one of them. You're a tall dude, in fairness to you. Yeah. So, like, talk to me then, because this sounds like one. Like, I always think of like, did you know? businesses in different categories and I've heard investors say well that goes in the too hard pile this doesn't sound like a very easy business to start which is good and bad mm, yeah, I think yeah. there's probably there was a lot of hurdles there at the start from a regulatory and a pharmaceutical perspective so within our products we have a mixture of you know, less regulated, which are supplements and cosmetics, shampoos, conditioners, that sort of thing, but then highly regulated medicines. So starting, we made a decision to get the licenses for those pharmaceutical products. That process can take up to two years. It re requires a lot of capital, right? a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of maintenance. And then within that becomes a lot of compliance. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to operate within a structure that's very regulated and compliant versus a traditional e-commerce business. Mm. However, certain investors may view us as e-commerce. So you need to make them understand the complexity, but with complexity comes a large moat and it makes it hard for other companies to enter our space. Mm. What does the license mean? Or what do you mean you need to get a license? Um, so you apply for a pharmaceutical license to supply that product to patients and retailers um, in the market. So we went through licensing at the time when Brexit was happening. We had hoped to do like a, a European type approach, but then we had to get a UK license and then an Irish license. And then since then we've got Germany. So that license allows you to trade in the market, allows you to supply the product. Um, but also from our strategy, it allows us to be multi-channel. So what I mean by that is we have a direct patient business. We have an Amazon marketplace business and you can find us in the shelves of Boots. Our competitors didn't pursue that long capital intensive business and they're focused on direct to patient. So that's mm. differentiated us. Okay. So no matter where you are, that's how I think of the podcast. I was like, I only said it to someone this morning over coffee. I was like, I don't really care where people are listening as long as they're listening. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's TikTok, whether it's so the same as yourselves, you don't really mind where people are getting it. So what products do you have? So I'm holding, what am I holding here? That's the minoxidil product. So that's a pharmaceutical product, but you can buy it in a pharmacy without a prescription. And mm. um, that product works by increasing your blood flow and oxygen to your scalp. Um, and it goes alongside our prescription product, but also underneath it, and I think it's so important to say that helps your hair come back. But our other range, which is your shampoos and your supplements, helps improve hair quality. So we try to marry it all together to, yes, get your hair back, but get it back in the best form possible. How did you start? Like, what was the first product you got to market? The, the, the minoxidil and also our prescription product, Finasteride, I think, you know, um, we were very keen to, to follow the science. So if we're going to set up, a, you know, a brand at an online clinic, um, you know, that you have products that, that are clinically proven to work. So we went down the path of, of, of getting the pharmaceutical licenses, which was, um, you know, there was 18 months to, to launch with that, um, which had a number of challenges. For, first of all, convincing to, to get a license, you have to find a manufacturer that has a dossier uh, and you effectively acquire that from them and then apply to the regulator. Um, we had to convince, um, you know, very established pharmaceutical companies to um, work with us. Um, I have a memory of flying over to uh, to Spain. We didn't even have a business name and I visited Cantabria Labs, who are main supplier for, for um, Minoxidil and have been since we started the business um, and pitched to their head of business development uh, you know, with just an idea, uh, and you know, he he took a liking to us, and they took a punt, and now you know, a few years later, we're their you know uh, their biggest client for for own level uh, label in the business. So, 
um, you know, def- definitely convincing suppliers, but also investors to, to come in and say, you know, we're going to realize revenue in uh, 18 months. That's, I was going to ask you, like, yeah. how did you survive for 18 months? Like, how did you keep going? I think as well, on our investors in the early stage, we did, we were lucky that we identified and our backers had come from the industry of, you know, pharmaceutical industry. So they understood the process and um, more generalist investors in that stage were like, well, actually, what happens if you never reach that approval? Whereas actually they were able to really understand that background and that really helped us. But yeah. they definitely needed to be patient because with anything in the pharmaceutical industries, there's delays and, you know, trying to get in your timeline. That was a challenge, but we, you know, we had really supportive investors and they're still very involved with us to this day. Did you raise money straight away when you started? Yeah, in, in you know, if we had the business idea at the end of 18, we, we, we raised a million uh, pounds, you know, in, in, in 19. Wow. Uh, you know, at stages along the way. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate, as Adrian said, to get backers in that had, you know, built consumer health businesses from scratch into, you know, hundreds of millions to exit to people who had, you know, uh, really strong e-com investing experience and then some who had like just really good um, business experience and helped us with stuff like corporate governance when, you, you know, you're coming in green in that area. So uh, really supportive backers that that, that support us in, in 19, uh, followed again in, in, in 21 and then um, you know, a, a story around 22, it was a very tough year for us, uh, supported us again at the, the end of 22 into 23. So, um, you know, we've been very fortunate to have that set of investors. A lot of them are Irish. Talk me through the raise because a million when you've no product is chunky. Like how did you, so how did you know you needed to raise a million and how did you go about doing it? Um, I think the, the, the number was derived from, um, you know, a business plan around kind of how do we acquire the, you know, and and get the licenses, uh, how do we um, provide for stock for the other products, uh, and then how do we commercialize the business. So we wanted to make sure we could set up our telehealth, our cloud pharmacy infrastructure, uh, build our website, uh, and then probably I think we looked at giving ourselves nine months six to nine months runway on marketing to try and whether that was <laughs> that there's no science behind the uh, behind that um and that uh yeah i mean that that definitely got us to you know we were able to buy kind of nine to twelve months really on 200k mrr on on you know uh, monthly recurring revenue on our uk business so i think that really started to give us a conviction that there was yeah, there was a business in this. And and the round wasn't fully structured in that we, again, go back to our investors' support in that some of them were willing to give their proportion of the capital knowing that the rest would follow. So it allowed us to get on with some of the things we needed to do. And as we gained mi- momentum and hit milestones, it was easier then to attract more capital. So again, going back to our first day investors, they really have been brilliant and supported us along the way. And where'd you find them? Because I think when people are trying to raise for the first time, they can often kind of spin their wheels a lot and spend a lot of time barking up the wrong tree. How did you find the right people to invest? I think it was a, a case of um, through a network of, of, of meeting people and understanding, um, you know, who in Ireland probably where, where we had most of our network had really strong experience in the area that we were looking to get into. And then a case of uh, getting in front of those people through either, you know, cold calling or um, through someone that we knew. Uh, so you identified people you wanted to invest and then use your network to try get into them. Yeah. Okay. And then I think always being, you know, you have to be very open to people saying no and just, you know, yeah. moving on with it. And then as we did it more and more, there was iterations of our pitch deck and we kind of went through that process. But, you know, you just have to get out there and ask questions because people are very generous with your time, their time, especially people who've had successes in the past. They're very willing to help. And I think that's a very strong attribute of Irish people as well. They want to help young Irish companies and we find that very beneficial. Where did you guys launch first? Was it UK or Ireland? UK. 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 And was that strategic because the market's much bigger? We w- Not strategic in that we hoped we would launch them both at perfect timing, but reverting back to the pharmaceutical side and Brexit, we had two applications running, one with the Irish regulator, one with the UK regulator, and it just happened that 
the UK licenses were approved faster. Um, and then from there, we just moved um, the Irish market soon after. 200k IMRR, so it's just running around in my head. How the hell did you get to that so fast? Th- three months in, we thought we were toast because, you know, COVID hit. So we three months were, in, uh, uh, so we, 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 you know, this is like the, we launched in, in Jan 20. So, um, we, we just thought something would break along the supply chain. You know, that was our fear. Like the factories won't be producing or the pharmacy won't be able to stay open. And we were very fortunate that, that, um, they remained open. Uh, and then what we found was, you know, from a consumer side of things, and I'm sure, You'd be aware of this, Gary, is like at that time, you know, people were you know, at home with more disposable income and, you know, certainly probably more time to think about personal care that benefited us. Um, and we were able to find kind of really successful acquisition channels at that time. Uh, we opportunistically created a TV ad uh, as well, kind of three, four months in because people were at home watching TV. That went really well. There was kind of a double effect with, right, we're in healthcare, so trust is such a big factor, particularly if you're doing it online. So TV as a medium was, you know, help build that trust. And then, you know, we saw our performance marketing channels um, become really efficient in parallel to that. Wow, so the two of them worked well together. Yeah. TV ad is ballsy though, a couple of months in, like that's yeah. big money, I would imagine. It, it was in the context of the size of the business. Yeah, it was. It was. De- it was definitely a punt. Um, one one that paid off. We 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 did bootstrap the production. I did. I did the voiceover, <laughs> recording it under my covers. So at home. So like, look, we were creative about how we did it. But um, now where did the ad run then? We would run. It, st- it still runs. Um, I'll, albeit we have a new one coming out. Um, in, in September, but it still runs. We'd run about a hundred and ten slots a day in the UK, wow. predominantly across Sky. Uh, and then in Ireland, we we'd run probably about twenty thirty slots. Uh, again, same same channels. Wow. How do you know yeah. it's working? Uh, I mean, there's attribution models you can put on it. We use a, a tool called TV Squared uh, that you can understand, basically attract someone um, if they come to the site within a period of time after the ad. That's it. it probably can be 50 to 60% right. But I think with all attribution, you do it blended. You bring everything together and see if, if it's working, and then you switch it off and see what the effect is. So we've kind of trial, trialed it along the way. But, right. but overall, we've, it's been an effective medium for us. That's a cool insight because that's something you don't really hear very often anymore. You're mm. very... I, God, I can count in the amount of one on one hand how many times people have said they're doing TV ads or yeah. radio ads. So you find it's still having an impact to cut through. Yeah, I think relative to again, go back to like you know if we look at like we're we're a healthcare business, right? You know, we're positioned as a lifestyle brand, but you know, I think it's important to drive you know if to drive trust. I think TV is a is a medium where you can do that, mm. uh, and I think that people are maybe aren't aware that you, you can do TV in in a. You can be creative with the costs, uh, you know, to, to, to get onto TV in terms of production and then in terms of, you know, uh, ads. I think a lot of the time people maybe, um, they might meet an agency that kind of put a cost in front of them that, that might be intimidating. But if you, like, we, we would have shopped around a lot and met different agencies. We had one that presented us a London agency was 5x the cost of a, an agency in Scotland. Yeah, so we obviously went with the... And back then we school. only had our, our own direct patient websites, but now the fact that we're in over a thousand distribution points with people like the leading retailers like Boots, mm-hmm. it just means you're you're creating brand awareness. And mm. I think you can't underestimate the amount of people that probably know the brand from the TV ad. You know, when you're in yeah. general conversations, people are like, oh, I've seen you at the football or I've seen you at the golf. So mm. you try and meet men where they hang out. And we do know yeah. sports is, is a really good medium for that. So you run the ads around sports, is it? Yeah, we we would have done um, like profiling to try and reach the target customer at the, you know, when we started the, got our marketing strategy in place and we would have profiled like, you know, you could have taken a, an F1 fan, right? And we would have then looked at running, uh, we ran uh, ads across F1. Uh, we then would have worked with all the F1 podcasts. Right, uh, and then we look at kind of getting influencers. Right, we weren't able to afford the, the F one drivers, but you're you're looking <laughs> at basically again in that interest base influencers. Then layer that down performance marketing. Cool. Uh, so that is how we would kind of run our. We still run our marketing strategy a lot. We look at a, a, a demographic, and then we'll look at you know where do they hang out, and then try and show where they are across, in, in you know whether it's offline or online. Deadly. So you'll pick like kind of like um. 
specific types of people and then build a profile around them and then build your marketing around that using that's really cool that's, that's right, really yeah. interesting i like that um what what worked for you early like what channels worked obviously tv played a huge part what else was working obviously this is during covid so it's slightly dated now maybe yeah. but we'll talk about now and then yeah. so what, what was working back then yeah there's definitely a difference you know in terms of you know uh, the what's happened with stuff like meta between then and now but you know that was extremely effective at the time you know still is very important but just isn't nowhere near as efficient and a very different uh, channel now Google is I, I think for us has always been steady right it's a shopping centre where people are going into they know what they're looking for mm. so um, that's been you know an effective channel for us um, I think we've we've always done a lot with influencers probably more at the the you know smaller micro level where we found you know um seeding products and then working with them for a period of time they document their their journey and and show the results and then their audience buy in we've seen that as as being effective um and then you know we mentioned tv i suppose you know um SEO as an online business obviously is something you know um, that you have to invest heavily in and then 2024 skip forward to now what channels do you find are working right now in 2024 yeah I, I think probably what's um, the other channel I probably missed there is we do a lot with um, you know in, in referral um, and you know we work with the likes of um, hair transplant clinics would probably deliver kind of 10 to 15 percent to customers for us each month um, that's a really strong channel. Um, we've been doing a bit of work with barbers. You know, naturally, that's a kind of that's a, a word of mouth piece, mm -hmm. and we want to do a lot more there. Um, so I think referral is is a big channel for us. Um, you know, that versus you know now versus then, you know, Meta, meta is still very important. Um, well, what changed? You said now versus then. What was the difference now? It, it, within that channel specifically yeah. so I suppose that you know look at the, the tracking um, and then the, the ad tool is, is less efficient you know with the changes that were made in 21 and also you, you could probably have a bit of secret sauce and having a really good paid performance team um, that are running the ad platform I think now it's the, the Facebook algos are doing a lot of that work so that's no longer uh, you know a, a USP for your business so we are now repositioning or have repositioned our team more towards creative. So it's all about, you know, um, producing content at, at pace and then, you know, iterating and, and trying to, to scale that on the platform. So I think that's probably been one big change in terms of how we, we, we market. Uh, TikTok is obviously another channel that, again, is is something that we're investing a lot in. And, you know, th that, that ad platform, it's, it's getting there. It's definitely something, you know, if you look at the, where the younger um, demographic are hanging out, you know, it's, it's somewhere where you have to be. So it's something that we're we're investing a lot in. And, mm, and the growth of the there is incredible. Go on back ahead, then, Jay. when we, you know, when it was COVID, we had a very small team, and as we grew quite quickly, we were having to move quick in terms of getting agencies in place. And I suppose from then and now, we've transitioned away from using agencies, which were brilliant at the time, to now having a lot of team in house, and that allows people to live and breathe the idea every day and really execute and own it versus an agency who has 10 clients and they have a lot of things to balance. So I think having a lot of that knowledge in-house now is really benefiting us. I and mean, the, the marketing team are excelling and doing lots of really creative things. And as Will said, really excited about our TV ad that's coming out in September. Okay, we'll have to have to roll yeah. that at some <laughs> stage during the pod. Um, talk to me then about like the two of you. Like, why do you have a co-founder? Because sounds like a great idea and it sounds like you kind of jointly came up with it but would you ever have done this on your own this thing specifically i think it actually required both of us because we both had ideas on it but we needed to share the knowledge and for me the co-founder model has worked really really well because i you know we do different things and you always know you have someone there to kind of bounce ideas on so for me that co-founder element has worked really really well and then in terms of raising the money, I want to go back to kind of like you'd raised a million and that kind of got you so far. But like you've raised multiple times since you've said there, mm -hmm. like what was the thinking behind that? Was that like required? Was that something you did to scale? What was the thinking behind raising multiple times? Yeah, I, I think the the funding's a, a lot of it to, to um, just to keep scaling and growing the, the business. Um, we had, you know, from 
launching in 20 to we would have said we got proof of concept the end of that year and um, we took more money in from our seed investors uh, in form of a, a loan note um, which kind of um, we were using a lot of that to build the business to a certain level and also build more territories so we were kind of we had UK and Ireland going and then it was about another big European market which was Germany still very much so in our plan and we've launched it's successful there but if we rewind back this is kind of end of 21 um, we, we invested a lot in getting that market going and we were speaking to you know we had tripled the business in 21 we were speaking to a number of venture funds in, in the UK uh, we're at term sheet stage so we were probably which is unlike, unlike Adrian and myself we were probably more focused on revenue as opposed to profitability um, I think we both come from a background in business you know certainly for myself and Kerry Group is you know was always very focused on, on, on boat metrics um, and we were looking at that and then we had the case of the, the war and um, you know in, in Ukraine and the term sheets with the, the venture funds they were just pausing on investing you know uh, really across the board not just in our sector to see how things would evolve that was put us in a position in uh, 22 where we were looking at you know it was March we probably had about six months runway with without any um access to capital and it was at a time where you know as i'm sure you'll know things things to raise money was very difficult so uh it was a very difficult year for for us uh i think going back on uh you know having a co-founder we probably found a lot of solace in being able to you know have the most difficult conversations bounce them off each other and uh, thanks for sharing that I think a lot of them, a lot of people wouldn't understand looking at a business like you going, what a successful business. They're on TV. Oh mm. my God, they're so successful. Um, but then like the butterfly effect of the war starting caused this ripple effect of it, of it, of it losing funding essentially. So how did you get through that? I think we, I think we were, we had a very, we had to move quickly and kind of, as Will said, we were focused on revenue and then really quickly overnight, we got the team to really understand that we had to go towards profitability and we were just clear on what we needed to achieve and we moved quick on our decisions and then we had our investors in behind us to know this is what we need to do and how to achieve it and probably then just having really, really clear fiscal responsibility in terms of what we spend on and what we don't and we were able to turn things around quickly it wasn't easy but we were very focused mm -hmm. on on that and delivering yeah i i think we were we were fully transparent with our team and with the investors on the position we were in and and you know where we needed to go like we always have a roadmap the, the roadmap was still similar but a little bit different because we had to get the we had to make more money bottom line mm. but we get our we get our team together every eight weeks and we do basically a you know a, a full team session on full p l trans uh, we're fully transparent with the full p l and how we're tracking against our our uh, our roadmap goals which are usually done out by quarter for for 12 to 18 months so we, we sat down with the team and said, this is where we need to get to in the next six months. You know, uh, how are we going to do that? And in fairness, a great reaction from the team when we shared the position we were in. Um, you know, we got everyone kind of binding in together rather than anyone getting, you know, um, wanting, to, wanting to leave or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, we, we were able to deliver profit by September, October that year. What changes when you're going from revenue to profitability? Because I think a lot of people listening won't kind of like go, what does that mean though? But why, if they were growing like a weed, what's the difference? Like how did you move from revenue goals to profitability goals? What did you leverage you have to pull? So we, first of all, we would have pulled, say, investment on. We were about to go into to Germany and, you know, any new market, you'll have to lay down a lot of, you know, investment that'll be loss making before you'll get it into profit. So that, that had to pause. Then it was focusing on right. We have our UK and our Irish business. Look at the data. What 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 products are working really well? Double down on those. What channels are working well? Double down on those. And and really was a case of just being really focused on what was working in in those markets because we could see all right actually within those markets, the business is close to profit. 
um, we probably we had to pause some some hiring plans for a few months uh, as well. And um, I think the other piece was we were intent on going into retail anyway, but we probably accelerated that by a few months. And again, I think the retail mix with, you know, direct to consumer, it's, you know, it can, you know, it blends together and makes the P&L more healthy in terms of, you know, upfront marketing costs to, versus customers. So I think it was a, bl a blend of all of that. But I think go back to testament to time, I think we were probably a team of about eight people um, that really just kind of, uh, you know, rolled up the sleeves together to, mm. to do it and delighted to say all, all that team are, are, are still with us today. I love the transparency piece because I think a lot of businesses are scared. They're scared to admit what's really going on. And the result then creates this vacuum of information, which results in fear, which results in yeah. implosion. I think it's there's a lot of like modern entrepreneurs like you guys who are, you believe in transparency. You believe in like telling the story, being honest, bringing the team on, on the journey for you. At any stage at that time, were you worried it was going to come crashing down? Yeah, you're definitely from, you're, you're worried from a financial perspective in terms of, you know, you, as Will said, we had six months runway. So how are we going to get there? What do we need to do? But, you know, as Will said, we focus on the data from a marketing perspective and operationally we did a full review on where we could identify savings. But I don't think we ever doubted that the business and the idea wasn't still working because we could still see mm. that incremental growth month mm. on month. We could still see all of that appetite. So we knew just roll up the sleeves with all of our team, know we can get through the pain points and, you know, mm. hopefully come out the other side, which we did. Yeah. I remembered one of our investors' advisors I was speaking to at the time and he just said, you know, how the management team behaves in this period, you know, that's going to be really testament to your, your success and your story. And that kind of stuck with me because I, I think um, you know we really faced into it uh, and we brought the investors along the journey of those few months but when we were able to demonstrate at the end of that year that we had taken the business into profit um, you know and kind of really changed like you're talking from a marketing perspective we went from like 10% contribution margin to like plus 30. What does that mean? So it means like, you know, basically your, your margin post your, your, your marketing costs, right? So we tripled our efficiency. They, they had then, you know, very, I suppose, trust and conviction again in what we were doing. Uh, and, and thankfully then they, they, they bridged us, uh, and, and we raised more money from them, which kind of brought us into, allowed us to kind of just focus on growth coming into 23. You know, and which was an you know an excellent year for for the business. We you know we we, we doubled the business, um, you know, and, and did it profitably. And then we were able to raise more money again, um, you know, towards the end of end of last year. So, but you know, it's I, I think everyone has these stories along their their journey, um, and I think that they do. You know, as difficult as they are at the time. I think they do make you a better business and, and effectively, I suppose, you have to be resilient. Um, you never know what's around the corner. Like, you know, we're doing well, but we're still a small business. Um, so I think that they, you know, they stand to you. You've stress tested it in probably the most extreme way as possible. So you've raised multiple times since. Um, I think the, the traits of the good founders that I have honored, they're all good storytellers not just externally, but internally as well. They're able to bring people on the journey with them, whether it's investors or whether it's staff. So what's been, aside from that, like what's been the most difficult moment for you personally, Adrian? Like what's what's been the biggest challenge you've found of being a founder? I think um, early on when we were at around our seed investment, so if you look at where you are now versus where you were then, you're much more resilient, you're much more tough, you're able to deal with it. But having left a very secure job and then you're trying to raise that funding, and you don't know where it's potentially coming from, but you can see the costs up ahead of you. I definitely find that very hard to deal with at the start because I was like conscious that we had to pay bills. Um, and that was something I find hard to deal with. But over time, you know, I learned how to cope with it and the mechanisms. And now I think you can be much more understanding that what you do in your business, it's not life or death. And as long as you're clear in what you're doing and you communicate with everybody without your investors, your customers, or your team, you will get there in the end and just persevere. But at the start, I find that difficult. Um, 
but that was probably my main thing yeah you talked about it there you touched on it's just it's not life or death like so how do you manage the personal and the professional like how do you balance we talk about body business and brain on this podcast for specific reasons um how do you balance those like how do you like yeah you, you definitely you, need to have a, a a clear separation from home and business although my wife might not say in terms of how much i could talk about it at times but it's ensuring you know I have a young son, Freddie, he's nine months old, making sure, you know, every day when I finish work, I spend time with him, I get outside, uh, exercise when I can. But it, it, it's really important to have your your family and your friends around you and, you know, just doing things you enjoy because, you know, I think I heard on a podcast recently and I fully agree with this. It's like you're working to live, not the other way around. So I think that's really important for me and I love socializing and, you know, that's what I like to do uh, in my spare time as well. And Will, how do you balance it? I think pr pretty similar to Adrian. Um, I, I would say the fam, like it's you know family first, and like um, I also I had a we had a, a baby fourteen months ago, uh, Liam. That's you know definitely has been such a change, but a positive change, and and you now need to be very present um you know with them and very conscious of that that they don't miss that time because it goes so so quickly <laughs> so i think um you know being present and, and spending time with, with with family um and also making sure you you know you your friends and your friendships like they're so important as well to you know keep timing um and they kind of bring you outside of the business and give you a, a release even though you don't realize you're, you know, that's not the purpose of it, but that's what you're mm. getting out of it. Um, I, I think aside from not just, you know, um, exercising or, you know, keeping fit and um, reading non-business books as well to kind of take your mind into other places. Um, yeah, it's probably socializing as a, you know, it's got a, that's covered in, in the friend part, but yeah, that's. So you both had a lot of transition in the last kind of couple of years. Freddie, what, nine months? Yeah. And your son is yeah Liam's forty, just yeah. almost fourteen so months. That, that's a lot of transition in a rapidly scaling business. Yeah, did it help that you both had children at the same time? Uh, I suppose. Well, you you went first in terms of you were. I was seeing kind of the impact, and you're able to understand. Okay, there's a big change on the way. I think people tell you you're going to experience a change, but until it actually happens, mm -hmm. um, and then just supportive partners and family, like you know, both our families have been amazing at helping us be able to do it. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's a lot of change, but it also helps your mind become incredibly focused. So when you're in work, mm. you're like, I am 10 tasks to do today. I'm going to get them all done yeah. and I'm not going to procrastinate. So mm. it actually helps you become more efficient. Yeah, I'd say there's like there's purpose as well in terms of like for, for me, it'd be around family, a, a lot of like, you know, family opportunities in terms of maybe your personal goals. You know, I, I think a, a kid, you know, brings another level up in that. Uh, so but definitely you've less time to be floating around thinking about work and you kind of just got to get in and get get to it so i think it would have been a new it would have been a different challenge if we had you know dependents our our, our, our chief commercial officer angus he used to always say you know when we were starting off he Angus had a couple of kids you know and he was definitely he was saying you know it's you know you're starting a business without dependents which is you know it's, it's probably easier uh, I don't think I, I still think you can start a business with 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 um with dependents. I think you you probably just need to have good people around you as well and a, and a good team to work with you because you you can't be everywhere if you're trying to be present with the family as yeah, well. Yeah, I think you both touched on it there in different ways. You have to be ruthless with your time because they have to go to bed at a certain time. They have to go to crash. They have to get picked up. You know, you have to spend that time and you want to spend that time with them. So I would agree. It's definitely made me more time conscious and better when I am working, when I'm working, I'm working. Whereas before yeah. you'd be like, ah, yeah, I'll do a bit now and I'll do a bit later. And you yeah. whip up yeah. the laptop at eight o'clock. Yeah. just don't do that anymore. So Sons is an incredible name, but would indicate that you've broader ambitions. Do you? Within... Within like sons is Within quite healthcare. a yeah, yeah. I mean, we've taken a, a very conscious decision to stay in in a in a single category, you know, uh, and, and left a lot of revenue on the table in mm -hmm. doing it. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made now in um, indications like you know we, we chose not to go into erectile dysfunction, we chose not to go into obesity, into testosterone, which you know, I, I think for us we feel. 
um, going back to the original kind of business idea that there is and ha- there is no and hasn't been a brand for a consumer brand for hair loss that's relatable and really motivate guys to take action in that area and we, we want sons to be that you know in in every channel um in, in each of the markets that we play and we think that if you go into other in health indications that it's more difficult to be synonymous with with that one so um you know that's uh, we have we have big plans but they're more around channel and market expansion mm. So, you know, we, we're probably in the last year and a half with retail uh, started our strategy. We're now, you know, we have over 1,200 distribution points. You know, we're 600 boots between the UK and Ireland, a couple of hundred super drugs. So it's really about, you know, uh, scaling that out. We launched into Germany in September last year and really exciting market. We're getting about 70 new customers a day in Germany. So it's it's about now trying to become the market leader in that market as well. We're on track in UK and Ireland and, and in doing it in more European markets. Um that that's really what what our, what what our our grand plans in the next kind of mm. I suppose 18 to 24 months are. And what like is it extremely difficult to launch a new territory? Like is it hard because obviously different language, different like, probably different channels like mm. how hard is it to do? Yeah, so from Germany in particular, that was a very challenging project in that EU regulation isn't fully homogenized, Germany being probably one of the most challenging markets. So we had to do a lot of research and invest a lot from a legal and a regulatory perspective right. to ensure our business model was fully compliant. So you know, Why again, did you go there? Sorry, what was uh, the original? So largest market from a commercial opportunity okay. plus um, the regulation allows you to execute the model in Germany, whereas in France, we couldn't have this same direct model as an example. Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, and again, it was similar when we're having to focus on profitability, we're having to invest a lot to really understand the regulation and the legal elements before generating any revenue. But now that we're in there again, that's built a moat mm. and a really robust business model to allow us to scale in that market as well. Okay. So it's weird that it's not homogenized. I nearly tripped over my words there. It's weird that it's not like, okay, you're in Ireland. That means you go to Spain, Portugal, Italy, Germany. Mm. They're all different, are they? They are. I, I think regulation is changing around yeah. kind of e-prescription and uh, direct mail delivery. And it, it likely will homogenize because that's really where the, the patient is going. And you know, certainly there's a lot of cases for if you look at like aging population and making it easier for them to, to, to get their, their medicines. So we do expect that'll happen. And, you know, as part of our, stra- of our strategy, you know, we're staying very close to that. And, you know, the, the other markets, like in, particularly in Southern Europe, we do expect to, to homogenize, um, but it's not there yet. And um, I think, you know, probably yeah i think like uh, there's a real place for online in healthcare if you look at all across the world healthcare systems gp waiting lists you know a gp doesn't want to be seeing someone that has hair loss so why hair loss and a number of other conditions why can't you homogenize that and bring it online the drugs are safe the models validated in the uk it's very advanced in the us so i suppose we remain hopeful that the uk and germany have led in that way, for, as as is up the US, that we can have homogenized example. Ireland is is slowly getting there, albeit there's still some resistance on the model. Um, but hopefully over time it will. What do you mean resistance on the model? Um, I think it's more a traditional market. So our strategy in Ireland is more focused on the retail setting, where we have boots as our largest part of our business. Um, the online model in Ireland just isn't as evolved. So there's resistance there to allow delivery of prescription medicines. Okay. It does seem like a business of the future, though. It does seem like this is how it's all going to go, right? And I think COVID accelerated a lot of that. Yeah, yeah in terms COVID of people's has thinking, been fantastic like, on yeah. that. Like some things just don't make sense, right? Queuing up, go to a GP just for a problem that's not like an yeah. urgent medical need. I think people's attitudes are changing, or I'm always very conscious to go, not everything's like you, but like, is that true that people are getting more focused on the preventive side of things? Yeah, from a preventative medicine perspective, we're seeing not just in hair loss, but on all personal care, people are trying to stay ahead of things, especially with the younger generation. So I suppose if you look at it clinically, when your hair is gone, you know, it's very hard to do something about it unless you want a very expensive hair transplant. Whereas if you slowly adopt the treatments and, you know, get into a routine, you can actually prevent that from happening over time. So the sooner you treat the problem or the condition, the more likely you are to see a benefit and a result. Mm. So like, 
what would you love to see like happen across Ireland in terms of getting people more aware, less stigmatized? Like, what what do we need to do as a nation to kind of like get a bit more health conscious? I think it's not just in hair loss. It's you know, it's that openness of a conversation. I think there's a lot of brands now focusing on taboo subjects. So how can we, number one, encourage the conversation to people be proactive about things and not procrastinate and then filtering down how can we be more healthy in our lifestyle? Obesity is becoming a major problem. So how do we improve diet, exercise? And then we need the government and, you know, the, the regulatory bodies to ensure that they will come along in that journey and ensure that we can drive convenience and accessibility because mm -hmm. that still remains a challenge for people. Mm. Like the... the the model of subscription as well. It seems like it's going to be one that's going to grow and grow and grow. I get my coffee on subscription now. Like stuff like that you buy all the time. It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense not to be getting it just to your door regularly. Like hopefully you're listening to the pod and you're feeling inspired. Maybe you want to do new things in your own business, or maybe you have that brilliant idea you've always wanted to bring a little bit further and see if it works. So why not right now? You listen to the majority of the guests in this show, and they've been helped by the local enterprise office at some stage in the journey. They have something for everybody. Whether you have that idea you want to develop, you want to get your products to new markets, you want to innovate your existing products, or you want to expand staff and premises, they have the supports to help. So why not today? If you want to start up or grow your business, then contact your local enterprise office today. Personally, then, like, talk to me about like how you look after yourselves, because we talk about the body and the brain, like we touched on earlier in terms of fitness and workout, but what things do you do as non-negotiables to look after your brain and your body? I start with with brain and go back to just trying to read, um, you know, and read stuff that isn't specifically business to, to try and, you know, switch off from it. Um, I think body is exercise and diet. So, you know. Um, Give me some specifics in terms of things that you do for your diet that make it good. Uh, I think I would, be conscious of getting your your veg intake, um, you know, and your fruit intake, uh, and when that has become more of a challenge time wise, uh, reference uh, my son. I, I've signed up to uh, subscription with with Huel around their kind of their greens uh, uh, supplement, which I take every morning, um, and you know, I, I just try and be conscious not to, to eat out too frequently uh, try and you know home cook meals um, a, a, as much as I can and um, so I think from a from a diet perspective that's what I do you know I love coffee but try not to drink too much of it <laughs> dazzle us with some science Adrian give us the, the scientific insights here yeah no, I think like it's it's time is always the challenge but you have to make time for yourself in order to perform and I think it's exercise you know two or three times a week albeit with a newborn being realistic that always doesn't happen and then your sleep's a killer exactly uh, my daughter's 19 months now and she's still a little bit fluctuating on the sleep's the one thing I can to kind of control well yeah in fairness Sorry. to Freddie not he he has been brilliant and that's helped a lot getting that routine back and then for me it's I love like sports is a really big relief for me in terms of whether it's playing or watching I just really can like get into that and really focus on it and that really takes my mind out of it so I think we've been lucky with Ireland doing quite well and golf and rugby and the Gaelic recently has been amazing so I find that a huge outlet for me and it just kind of gets me away from everything mm. and then talk to me about like the future like what does the future hold for for sons I think What's the big ambition kind of 18 24 months out I think just from the product side first and then Will can go a little bit into the commercial mm. where we're not just you know focusing on the, the hair loss product specifically so we're launching a new dandruff medication at the moment because again it's a really close to hair it's a taboo subject we're also trying to always identify new product opportunities that can you know we have something for everybody there's so much we can do in the german market as i said is like the largest market we've set up a really interesting business model and further afield we're looking at you know what can we do in amazon in the us and all of those opportunities so we're we've, we operationally we've put the structures in place to be able to do that and then hopefully that'll translate into some interesting numbers mm. well give me yours before we hit our hit our quick fire round yeah i, I think from a, a, a look at a customer side, you know, we probably this year would treat, you know, north of 150,000 guys. I think we see that, you know, over the next three years, we want to treat, you know, over a million. Um, probably category leader from a, you know, 
a, a online e comp site in, in, in UK and Ireland. It's now about doing that in retail as well. So, number one positioning in the likes of Boots, Super Drug, um, you know, uh, Irish Pharmacy uh, channel is a, is a really exciting channel. So, um, you know, d- doing that here as well. And then Germany is, is a big market for us. So, we got in. That's doing really well so replicating what we've done in the UK UK and Ireland then I think we'll probably do another two to three markets in Europe in the next kind of 24 months Uh, certainly Holland we're looking at Sweden as well Uh, top line level for us it's about being the the category leader in each of the territories we play in so I think by doing that we should say in kind of two three years time we should be in that position in Europe cool We'll do a quick fire round. First, I want to know your founder formula for success. Obviously, it's called the Entrepreneur Experiment. I'm trying to figure out the perfect formula for success. So I'll ask you individually, what's your founder formula for success? So, Adrian, I'll start with you. Um, I think the the lived experience has been very important to that because you really understand what what the consumer is feeling, whether that's the self-esteem, the confidence, um, and then from your prior experience, industry knowledge. You know, if you, if you know a sector, really go after it, and I think that can help you. So personal experience plus industry knowledge yeah. equals success. Will? Uh, you got to go first, you fecker. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, they're all yeah. individual. No, they're all personal. I, 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 so it could I, be anything. Look, I think from from relative to our own story, yeah, I, to I, you, I, yeah. I, I think the being very close to the problem or the opportunity um, can help a lot. So like lived experience. It doesn't have to necessarily be lived experience, but... I think understanding the the problem or the opportunity that you're going to or trying to address. Uh, I think the the other one that I would say is around curiosity and and optimism. I think as you know, as a founder, uh, consistently looking at like how you grow and how your business grows. Um, is a formula to success. I think we consistently bring back um, things to the business from when we meet people, right? We meet people and they mightn't be in the same industry, but they are, um, they're doing something interesting. You bring that in and you, you're agile enough to be able to um, to do something and, and uh, with that idea. And I think that that is something that, you know, I, I, I would embody Adrian also does as well and I think that's definitely been a formula to success Deadly. thank you very much a quick fire round what book would you recommend every entrepreneur read Adrian I really enjoyed the one um, by Phil Knight the Knight founding book in terms of it became just really helped me understand the graft of what you have to do and the lengths to get there from you know he flew all over the world with an idea to get there and then I think it articulated the challenges of scaling and, you know, no, no day is easy. So I really enjoyed that one. Shoe dog. Will? Currently reading a book, Good to Great, um, that I've just started, um, which I think is, you know, focused on, you know, businesses, how you win in the, the long term. Uh, and it's a lot of it's around, you know, kind of that focus. And a lot of I've taken a lot of relevance in terms of our strategy. So um, good to great. What's something you'd learn the hard way? learn the hard way was probably the time and effort on certain parts of the business to get it right so you go in with an assumption at times being optimistic as entrepreneurs that it'll you know take a short period of time but you have to be quite realistic in terms of you know how long it will, it will take to get there well uh i think learn the hard way pro- probably focus you know i think when you're starting off and things start to work, you, you, you automatically think you should go everywhere. And you can maybe ignore how much you can get from just being very focused on what's working now and doing more of that. So I think we probably learned that the hard way. Focus, I like it. What's something you've sacrificed to achieve your success? I think you definitely have to let things socially go in terms of, you know, really, you know, bringing in that focus into your life. Um, you still get to do most things, but you just, you know, at times there's going to be half the sacrifice you make because, you know, you need to get a project done or you need to get something. So, yeah, you have to make social sacrifices at times. Yeah, I think pretty similar over the last few years. It's a um, not a huge amount of holidays. Uh, so uh, I'd say social holidays um, has been has been something. 
What would you do today if you could be 10 million euro? Invest it in sons. <laughs> Most common answer. No, give, give me a balance. You can invest some of it, but not all of it. I, I think, yeah, there's there's so many interesting companies out there um, in Ireland at the moment, and we're both lucky to be part of the EY Entrepreneur um, scheme this year and just have seen so many mm. really interesting companies. So I think there's there's a lot of interesting Irish-based companies that you could invest in. Yeah. One, okay, I'm gonna, one in particular that I, I really was impressed by the it's a company Fire. It's developing a heart failure device. Um, the CEO Connor Hanley, really really impressive guy, and it's entering pivotal ta- trials in the US. So it could gain approval in a multi billion dollar market. And what really impressed me about that was um, Connor's optimism, his ability to tell the story, and a company from Ireland you know, really going after the US and global scale. So his ambitions is to IPO that company and, you know, really impressed by him. Love it. Thanks. I had not shared about that one. Will, what would you do today if you give you 10 million euro? Um, I think, like, if you're looking at it from investing in a, a business perspective, uh, I'd say, again, you know, there's so many, uh, we've been exposed to so many great Irish businesses in the very recent past, a lot of it through that EOI um, Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year program. Uh, t- there's a litter of those you could invest in. If you're going to put me on the spot again, I there's a really interesting business, Embryonics, um, which is a, a there's a family in Galway, uh, two brothers and a, and a sister, the the Mackies, and they're developing uh, lasers to to go onto satellites, so effectively building the internet in space, and you know learning that they're you know uh, winning against you know. US German companies so I did not think you were going to say lasers to quite a satellite there it sounds like a Dr. Evil thing <laughs> yeah. going to get a giant so, laser that's it yeah <laughs> so um, and, and I you know, thought it was pretty cool that you have a you know a business in Galway that's uh, you know competing you know um, at that stage on, on, a, on a global um, scale so again I think that, that that's a business that could absolutely blow up that's class and I haven't heard of it either what's something in your daily routine you wish you started sooner um I think that balance actually since having um, a newborn ready in the family were those times where, you know, you would just let the evenings go on and you just constantly work because you didn't have that focus. So that structure has really helped me in terms of just, you know, knowing when I need to get things done. Mm-hmm. And then that's freed up personal mind, which then, you know, you come back in the next day and are, you know, better at what you do. Will, what's something your daily routine you wish to start sooner? I, I, I wouldn't say daily. I think it's probably a bit further out than that, but it's just planning uh, planning my time and saying no to things. Uh, you know, so we have less time now and, and then, okay, this is a, uh, relevant to where we're at now. We have more people, but it's delegating and, and stepping away from certain things. So I think just, just you know, more proactively managing, managing my time. Mm. If you were to start a new company in the morning, what would it be? Um, I probably come back to, you know, very focused on health. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting things happening and trends around the aging population and moving away from one drug for all conditions and how can you deliver other services around the treatment. So that could be counselling, that could be, you know, apps to improve compliance. So really, I think there's a lot of interesting things around fertility testosterone and men I, I, I'm really interested in that space okay well what would you start in the morning if you start a new company uh, right now I think based on what we're picking up along the way I think again it's just you know we probably know a lot about you know health um, and from again what you know what you can disrupt through digital um, and then I would say through the you know doing it through a you know a brand so uh, a lifestyle brand so you could take conditions I mean there's stuff within obesity for example which is a a massive issue that that um, I think that there's you know uh, business there and that from female perspective you know hair loss <laughs> you know so, so there's I, I think it would probably be something in that space albeit um, we're not thinking about that right now it's a okay lot, just try to give people a few ideas if they're uh, listening to something that could start a lot more to do what do you believe other people find strange or strongly disagree with For, they disagree with me personally mm. um, that's a difficult question um, probably sometimes in 
in work, it may be your like approach to things in terms of, I think since starting a company, you probably have to digest things and move quite quickly, fast. And sometimes people would find it hard to understand how I got to that point. So in taking a step back and really trying taking time to explain, um, that's, yeah, I'm not sure exactly on that one. Well, G- give me the question. Yeah. Yeah. So, what yeah. do you believe that people find strange or strongly disagree with you on? Um, I, I I think that I although I I feel that I am self aware to an extent. My messaging at times is probably um, could be more collaborative. I've t- I've been I, I ask like, we we've actually just gone through our, our kind of half year reviews with the team, so we ask for feedback as well. Okay, uh, from them in those sessions, which uh, you know was was it consistent? So it's probably just my awareness of, um, like we, we would, I think Adrian and myself and actually being friends starting a business like we one of our values like the business down to earth and, um, being humble. And prob- I, I probably then feel that I can maybe speak to the team the same way I might speak to Adrian. But actually, I gotcha. the, yeah. that person may take what I've said in a different context. So context it's matters. Probably, so I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah, I get you. So that, that's, um, I think, feedback that, that I've been given and I'm taking on board. Oh, I see. They're, they're listening now. They're like, he is listening. Yeah. <laughs> What's one thing in your personal life you spend money on that brings you immense happiness? Um. I think holidays with your family because you can fully detach from work and just spend uninterrupted time. Um, that's a big one for me in terms of we, we as a family love to get away and do things whenever we can. Mm. Do you have a favourite spot? Um, in Ireland where we love Donegal, we're going this weekend and, you know, although the weather's never great, it's just nice to be quite remote and go on beach walks and, you know, just have, we don't have Wi-Fi where we stay generally and it kind of just allows you to touch. So nice. that's a, quite a good thing. Will, what do you spend money on that brings you immense yeah, happiness? I, th- I think probably just e- eating out with the with the family, um, you know, l- l- getting less probably evening date nights at the moment <laughs> or for the last... If we do years. breakfast now, that's our Bre- new go-to. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> it's that's a new hack. That's yeah. what I'm going to. So breakfast. Breakfast or, you know, uh, you know, brunch. And yeah, that's, you know, at the weekend, I could do do a lot of that. So yeah. yeah. Breakfast is the hack. Me and my wife every month do a live breakfast. We sit down, just us. Love it. And uh, it's cool. What's your final piece of advice to any entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur listening? I think the focus element has been something that we really benefited from. So, you know, you have an idea and, you know, you're just, you really focus in on it and and understand as much as you can about that opportunity by speaking to people and doing your research is really important and avoid distraction, which, you know, as entrepreneurs, you see lots of opportunities. Mm. So just stay focused on that, on that roadmap until you deliver it. Well, um, for me, I'd say for anyone starting out, really understand the, the problem you're addressing and then you can, conceptualize that into like what's the the business or the brand that maybe you're challenging that exists mm. already because there'll, there'll always be something yeah. in the space even if it isn't exactly what you're looking at try and really understand that and then i think validate it you know uh, we spoke about you know doing our survey with 100 people try and validate it with your with your network and don't be afraid to meet people in the industry meet competitors and ask them about what you're going to do because I we found people are always willing to share information. Yeah, it's amazing. People are far more open than you think they'd ever be. Um, where can people learn more about Suns? Um, the easiest way is on suns.ie or suns.co.uk. Perfect. Adrian, Will, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary.